All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Water Talk. Um, I'm excited, uh, I've been excited for this one for a little bit. Uh, we have, um, the, the this, this session is on tips and tricks for using Ruby scripting in InfoWorks. And uh, today, um, I'm excited that we have a guest presenter, uh, Luke Butler, um, who, uh, um, He's he's going to introduce himself in a, in, a, in just a second, but um, if uh, but my name is Nathan Gertz. I've I've been helping with these uh, for for a few sessions. Um, it's been it's been fun so far this year. We've been getting into a little bit more a little bit more nerdy topics, which uh, which has been, has been good for engagement. Um, and we have a number of upcoming talks, which we'll talk about later. But uh, um, that's me, um, Luke. Do you want to introduce yourself and kind yeah, of what, sure. what got Sorry. you in this? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I'm Luke Butler. I, um, I work for a small uh, consultancy up here in Canada uh, called C3 Water. Um, I specialize in uh, clean water modeling or just water distribution modeling, which is maybe a little bit different from what you'll find uh, in North America. And I'm also basically a, a part-time programmer, so using a lot of code to either make my own applications or sort of automate things. Uh, and my experience is uh, not just only here in North America, if you can't tell from my accent, I'm originally from Australia, uh, and I've also worked and lived in the UK as well. So I had a bit of experience building, calibrating, making models, just writing software all throughout the world. So yeah, very excited to be uh, here presenting this topic. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Yeah, I, I'd been um, noticing some of your LinkedIn posts over the years, and it seems like you've you've been sharing you know scripts with the modeling community for a while and doing some really cool stuff so i've been i've been exciting just to i've been excited to see what what you what you, you're going to present today yeah it's um, a little different from what everyone else does where you're more open with the way that you you share so yeah always keen to to share back a little bit so yeah yeah um absolutely so uh if you're new to our water talks um welcome uh glad you came um and really one of our goals with these is um we want to give you lots of content but we will also want it to be a little bit informal and conversational so we really do want to get questions from you so in your uh go to webinar um, panel that you should have floating somewhere on your monitor um, there's a questions drop down and please um, enter in any questions that you have. Um, uh, only uh, Luke and I will be able to see them. So like, no, you know, don't, you know, just feel free to push out any questions. Um, we'll try to save some space at certain points in the, in the, in the talk to, to answer questions. Um, I'll try to spot if it's um, relevant specific to what Luke's talking about and I'll, we'll try to answer it um, on the fly. But, but yeah, to, don't, don't hesitate to throw in some, your questions. And um, just a heads up for our upcoming talks, um, we are interviewing some some guest uh, speakers from around the world. Kind of just um, it's kind of a around the world series for Infoworks ICM. Um, so uh, next week, yeah, we're we're going to be interviewing a couple consultants in Australia, um, and and hearing how they've used ICM. In, in projects in us in Australia and it's just fun hearing um, just the different ways um, how different uh, different hydrology methods are used and you know the tips and tricks used there um, the following week um, I'm going to be helping interview uh, a, uh, a modeler in Texas who actually was using some ICM engine with some SQL queries to actually uh, help in tracing COVID uh, throughout throughout collection systems um, definitely an interesting topic that's that's timely. And then finally, we're going to end up with a, a case study in the UK. And I honestly don't know too much about that one yet, but it's going to be good. Um, just just wait. So um, the signups are there on our website um, with with a little bit more snippets on on those. So um, if you're interested, uh, definitely jump in. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Luke to uh, get started with um, today's content. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, so I'm assuming most of you saw the title, so you have at least a little bit of understanding or interest in Ruby scripting. Um, so Ruby scripting is available in um, a few products from Innovise, um, mostly what you would call the workgroup products. So those you probably know as you know, InfoWorks ICM, InfoWorks WS Pro, uh, and Info Asset. So we'll dive a little bit into how you can use scripts and what they're for uh, shortly. Um, but if you're using any of the other products, say like InfoWater or something like that, there, there aren't the opportunities to use these similar scripts. So this is really limited just to the workgroup set of products. Um, but we thought before we um, 
dive too deep into the world of Ruby and scripting, it'd probably be a good idea to get a bit of a knowledge on how competent everyone and how comfortable everyone is with programming. So I think Nathan's going to put up a little quiz for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to just ask the question on like, what you think your skill level is at the moment um, with, with Ruby. So, yeah, so you should see, yep, so you should see uh, a poll uh, popped up. Um, so are you an expert with, with scripting in Ruby? That's great. Um, are you comfortable uh, in, in scripting, maybe another language, but not Ruby? Um, maybe you have some exposure to coding, like some college courses, haven't done much with it lately, or maybe you're, you're totally new to it with no experience. So we'll take. We're, we're, uh, yeah, we're expecting most people to be sort of either very new to this, or maybe just on a little bit of VBA coding or something. We think this is really going to lean towards the, uh, the 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 learning side. So, but it's always good to make sure we're not diving in too deep or anything like that. If 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 people are too new, so see how much longer we'll get to get this finished, and then we can look at the results. Yeah, yeah. So far, eighty-five percent uh, have voted. Um, let's take uh, three more three more seconds. Three. Two, one, and all right, close. And I'm going to share the results because I think it's interesting. So you should see uh, uh, kind of the distribution. Um, uh, very cool. We have a couple couple self-proclaimed experts on the call. That's that's awesome. <laughs> um, I didn't. Know. Uh, but but yeah, definitely it does it does tend to weigh more heavily towards no experience. So um, it's interesting. It's almost half half, right? Half with uh, some level of experience yeah. in some coding, and then almost another half with uh, no no experience at all. So interesting yeah. crowd. So it's good to see that uh, people who are even are totally new to, to coding, maybe they see the potential, the interest there. So um, the results aren't too unexpected. We, we thought there would be more beginners than, than experts. Uh, and really, I thought we'd just give a bit of an overview on the presentation before we dive deep into it. So uh, you know, those people who are very um, you know, comfortable with programming don't get too bored at the start. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, where you you know what you can do with Ruby, and then we're going to dive into how to to learn Ruby um, and an interactive coding session. And these are really going to be more for so the beginner level, so not totally new to programming, but maybe a little bit of familiarity. So if you're totally new and you can't follow it, don't worry. There's going to be um, I'm sure we're going to share this later. We'll have all the links, um, and you'll be able to take it at a slower pace later. Just come along for the ride, and then we'll we'll end up with um, some examples, um, both small scale and large scale of using Ruby. Um, so if you're more of a, an expert or deeper in, just come through that, that journey at the start because everyone was a beginner at some stage, and then you'll get that bigger vision at the end where we can actually take this. Okay, so what can you know? What is Ruby? What can you do with it? So Ruby is a, a programming language, a scripting language, and with that programming language, it lets you interface directly with Infoworks with code. Um, so this example here is Infoworks WS Pro, but it, you know you could write scripts to update data. You could modify the the geometry. So if you wanted to change anything in the the data grid here or the geometry, you could write code to do that. If you want to do demand analysis or demand allocation, so you know assign customers to points or you know, you can do that with Ruby as well. You can modify the tree in the master da database. So a really good example is creating selection lists. So if you want to dynamically create your selection list every time you make a change, you can make uh, you can write some script to help you with that. And that was a big help uh, when I was doing some consulting work because you make one little modification, then you got to regenerate all the selection lists again. It's a it's a nightmare. Um, you can run simulations as well. So you can open networks, change things in, run simulations on demand. Uh, you can read the simulation results. You can import, export data. So you can import and build full models. You can export those results, including results into other systems. Uh, and you can also validate and audit your network. So you have uh, validation tools built into uh, Infoworks, but you can do custom validation as well. So say if you're submitting to a client, you want to check that you're meeting their specifications. You can write Ruby scripts that you know maybe you give to a junior modeler to check first before he gives it to the senior guy just to make sure you know simple stuff like the user text fields and those are all set up correctly. Um, and now there's two ways you can also run Ruby script um, in Infoworks. The first is through the user interface. So you can have Infoworks or Info Asset open, uh, select network, and then do run Ruby script. And you can pick a script and it will run instantaneously right in front of you. Um, if you've got a really favorite script that you're using lots, you can actually assign it to a couple of toolbar buttons as well. Um, so you can you know, quickly press them and run them. And then the second option, which is slightly more advanced, is the command line uh, interface. So you can 
or use a, a little tool called iExchange uh, at your command line, and you can pass in Ruby scripts to run the models uh, or whatever you like without the thing open. So a couple of reasons why you want to do that, maybe you have a very large model or you have multiple things you want to run or you're running a, on a server or you're interfacing with multiple applications. Um, that's sort of the, the, the realm that you would go in there. And there are some limitations on what you can do in one than the other. So the user interface, you can mainly uh, work with what you see directly in front of you in the geo plan. Uh, and with very limited options to work on the tree or on simulations, uh, while the command line gives you access to everything. You can do almost anything you can imagine yourself manually doing in, in InfoWorks, you can do it in the command line without the, the tool open. Um, That's great. We do have yeah. one one question. Oh, sure. um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, th so this question is: Can you show us a simple implementation of Ruby code so we know how to get started ourselves after the webinar? And uh, I, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll just let you know. Yes, we're 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 about to get into that definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We um, just uh, you definitely want to get straight in, but um, because you know we have a lot of beginners, we thought we'd give a little bit of a an intro to to start Ruby, and then there will be an interactive coding session where. I will nervously be running Ruby code live <laughs> and going through the processes of, of writing the scripts. And we'll also provide examples for you to take away later. So definitely it's good to see you're keen to, to, to get going. Um, and then another thing I think that was probably brought up earlier was, um, you know, if you wanted to run iterative uh, runs, and I know this is something you were talking about, Nathan, where if you wanted to um, say, make modifications to your network and rerun the network and then read the results and then make changes. So you're like trying to hone in the right calibration or something like that. Um, people, that's usually the first thing they want to do, but it's very complex. And it's also something you can only do with the command line and not the user interface. Um, and the command line tool is also a separately licensed product. So you need to be specially licensed to have that access. So it's while it's great to have big dreams, maybe always best to start with the user interface first and then slowly work your way up until you feel you need that extra bit of tooling. Yeah, and uh, th th yeah, there's a few questions on right. on the the difference between those two um, that I'll, I'll, I'll speak to. Um, so the user interface, um, which you can met modify the, the active geoplan, your active network, that is included with any InfoWorks product, uh, ICM, WS, Info Asset Manager. However, the command line option um, that does require a license called iExchange. Um, you know, you can reach out to your local InnoVisor representative. Um, uh, it, and so that is required if you want to do any kind of automation. And so it, you then run uh, run it from command line. It does. You don't need to actually access your ICM license, you access the API license. So you can then do everything without actually opening ICM or checking out your, your existing ICM or WS license. And so there are users that have automated scripting you know, on a nightly basis at midnight, for example, where um, there's a script that will make edits to a model, maybe update it and so on. But behind the scenes is just checking out that API license. Um, think, any more questions or we want to jump to the next quiz? Yeah, let's jump to the next quiz for now. Okay, so. The next quiz, this is the last one, so don't worry, we're not going to be asking lots and lots of questions. It's about, you know, what are you most interested in? So I believe this is just a one option one, right, Nathan? Yes, yeah. yeah. So whatever you think is the, the most interest to you in um, using the Ruby scripting, where do you think the most potential? Um, if you have something other, feel free to tick that and drop it in the the, the, the question section as well. Well, we're getting some results in. It looks like it's uh, coming across almost evenly across the board. Here we go, Honor. Oh, no. mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, a good majority have have voted. Um, let's yeah. take another uh, ten more seconds or so. The, the, yeah. Good news yeah. is that it's looking towards more things that you can do. Definitely in the. Uh, user interface. Um, you didn't all just want to automate simulations. Yeah, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and close that. Three, yep. two, one. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and share that. Yep. Um, very good. Any any comments, Luke? Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, I can see um, cleanup, man, you know, maintenance, imports, 
and then analyzing the results. It's interesting that it's like split evenly there between data cleanup management and analyzing results. And those really are probably the two things that I do the most. And you'll see later on a lot of you know bringing in information, uh, fixing it up. Uh, we show sort of demos of that. Um, analyzing the results can be interesting. It's very easy to to get certain bits of information, especially if you want to summarize it in Ruby scripts. Um, but yeah, it's definitely you know. Uh, yeah, it's good. The only, I guess, tricky thing about analyzing results, if you want to make modifications and run them again, you get slightly more advanced. But uh, yeah, definitely lots of uh, avenues in Ruby to help you with all of those options. Yeah. Okay, so let's get straight into the depths of it. Um, so how do you learn Ruby? Um, now, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. And I think that the, the most important thing to acknowledge to start with is learning to code is is hard. If you haven't done it before, um, it is a, a long journey. It's not something you can just do a, a day course and come across. It, it's a skill that you need to work on um, over a long period of time. And I think this is a really interesting graph on an article that I saw called "Why Learning to Code Is So Damn Hard." Uh, and it's it, it really shows that you know as you're going through this process, if anyone's ever learned to code, you'll you'll realize that you know that first segment where you're following some tutorials, it's all really nice. So they're holding your hand. Everything's working really well. Um, and it's only once you get to the tip here that you go, okay, now I want to do my own thing everything seems so much harder because you're not following a tutorial anymore. You don't know how to solve your problem. If you find, find problems as well in your code, you don't know how to describe and then find the solutions. So you generally find that after you move away from those simple basic tutorials, you, you almost get this lull and, it, and, and maybe a little bit of a, you get a lot of drop off of people who don't want to do programming anymore. So you find it very difficult here. But once you do start to learn how to solve your own problems and move forward and make your life easier, it just becomes, you com your confidence goes up, you can solve so many more problems and you eventually get um, to a level where it can make a huge difference. But getting over this lump is definitely uh, a big issue. And, and really it's all about making sure you're learning efficiently at the right time with the right resources. So you'll generally find there's tons of resources for the beginner stage tons of resources for people who are know what they're doing, but very little in, in the middle. And even if they do exist, you probably have a hard time finding them. Um, and probably not surprisingly, um, Innovise provides documents on either side of that graph. So you have uh, two documents that are provided uh, for learning Ruby um, from Innovise. On, if you go to their online help uh, site, you'll see something called Exchange and Intro Introduction to Ruby Scripting. So the Introduction to Ruby Scripting is a you know, it's an 80 page document that leads you from the very basics of running the first scripts to you know, understanding the syntax, getting a few things done. And then they have this document called Exchange, which is for programmers. It's about 180 pages of very technical documentation listing every single method and property within the programming language for programmers. So if you finish this, you're probably gonna hit a stonewall very fast if you go to, to this document. It's very detailed, it's very much oriented for um, professionals. So occasionally I get asked, you know, then what's the best way to learn if I want to start Ruby? Well, Ruby isn't just a programming language for uh, InfoWorks or InfoAsset. It is like a full programming language you can do other things in. So there are other resources you can learn online. So it's something like Code Academy is a good uh, resource if you just want to dive into the fundamentals of how the language works, do it in the browser. It's very simple. I haven't used it myself, but there are other you know, resources like this. If you've had a little bit of programming experience and you sort of know, there's another really great resource called Learning Ruby the Hard Way, where they drill you through exercises and you know really teach you every single aspect and, and really good practices. Um, one thing to be aware of is if you ever see anything about Ruby on Rails, just ignore it. Ruby on Rails is um, a it's like a an add-on you could almost say to help build web applications. It has nothing to do with what you want. So if you start seeing that, just abandon ship and then move on to just pure Ruby. Uh, you'll probably find that quite a bit. There's probably more people doing Rails, Ruby on Rails, than there is pure Ruby. So that can be a bit of a trap for beginners. Um, and one other thing is I noticed there was a bit of a, a gap in the middle. So I've been trying to, um, as Nathan said, share things on LinkedIn. So I wrote a little article um, a little while back on you know, using Ruby scripts to automate your model builds and your the Open Data Import Center. So I do have um, this on my LinkedIn page. I'm sure we'll be able to provide a link that steps you through all the stages of building a Ruby script to importing the data, or filtering it, that type of thing. And we will show you some more advanced versions later. Um, and then we'll also touch on this. I did develop a set of example scripts. I think there might have been 15 or so of them. They're from very simple to very complex, so that you can, you know, instead of um, 
having just beginner scripts, real life examples of solving problems with Ruby scripts that anyone can download, open, run, and change. So they are some extra resources that I created for the community to help um, get things, get them going. Now, if we're gonna graph these with uh, no experience right on the left and expert right on the, on the right, uh, this is sort of how I would place things. So if you haven't ever started before, definitely look at the Getting Started Guide, maybe Code Academy. If you have some experience, start looking at these resources. Um, if you're an expert, just jump straight into that documentation, look at my open source examples, you'll be at home very, very quickly. Ruby is a very easy programming language if you've done it before. So that's uh, sort of where I would list anyone who's new, the 50% of you should probably start Code Academy on that little document there. Um, and then if you want to start Ruby, what, what do you need to actually do it? Well, you only need um, a text editor, um, but don't go and open Notepad. While you can open Notepad, write some code in like this example here, uh, your life will be much harder than it needs to be. There are dedicated text editors for coding. So a couple of examples are Notepad++, which I know Nathan uses, uh, and VS Code, which I use. Um, so they both will do the same thing. They'll they'll have like numbering on your code here. They'll highlight your the syntax to make sure you're typing things incorrectly. Um, and they manage files just uh, much more nicely. You can have multiple files open, that type of thing. So definitely look at getting something a little bit more advanced. If, if your computer is locked down, you can download Notepad++ without installing it. If you do have a little bit more access, definitely VS Code um, is nice as well. Um, but yeah, you'll have many headaches if you start using Notepad too much, so please try to avoid it. Um, okay, so this is now the scary interactive coding session. We'll see how uh, well we go. So we're gonna open up. I'm gonna do this all in, um, can you see that both sides now nicely, Nathan? Yep. Okay, I'm going to do this in um, InfoWorks WS Pro. So while all these examples will work in ICM, InfoWorks, uh, or WS Pro, or Info Asset, I'm most comfortable in uh, WS Pro, so that's what I'll use. But don't be scared. What you're seeing is totally transferable to ICM. The same methods, the same ways of interacting with the data apply for both products. Um, so what I'm going to show you is the the, probably the most simple script you'll ever see. It's a classic. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna output the words hello world in a script. Uh, and this is a little script called example.rb, which means Ruby script. And we have a little network here open uh, in InfoWorks. Now, if we wanna run this script, we go network, run Ruby script. You find the directory it's saved in, so example.rb, and we press open. Um, and InfoWorks will run that script for you. There you go, so it's done exactly what it says. So puts is a command to say output uh, to the command line. So it's good for debugging, you know, putting the process so you know where things are going. Um, but, you know, that's not a real program, so we need to do something a little bit more exciting. So for example, we could, um, you know, get the version, so InfoWorks version. If we wanted to interrogate information from uh, WS Pro, we can go, version, and so we're, we're basically asking WS Pro to give us the version, and we're gonna store it in a variable, and then we're gonna output that to the um, command line. So say this is InfoWorks version, and now if we wanna include that variable in the string, we can do a little, little thing here where we put the hash and then two parentheses, and we can insert that in, and we'll take that variable and insert it into this uh, these, th these words here. So these are things that I show you how that works. If I run this script, now we could go network, run over and over, and then you probably get very tired of doing that. Um, so I mentioned before, we can do the custom actions. So to get that, we go master database settings, um, use the custom actions, and we have an option here for up to 10 custom actions. We say, okay, we want uh, always to run the example script. If we click action one, that's okay. And you can see up here, we've got these 10 Ruby scripts. So to make our life easier, I can now just click this and it will run that script. So it's gone and asked InfoWorks, what version am I using? And it's then put it in a little um, you know, output here to say the version. Now, obviously not super useful, but maybe we want to start collecting information from the, um, the network. So we will need to get a reference to this open network. So the way that we do that is we once again create a variable, and we're going to call it net for network. And we're going to say WS application. That's the this application we're calling. And we're going to say we want the current network and that has now stored this current network in a little variable here uh, and say we want to get some information from something so let's say we have this lone hydrant here in the network uh, we can see all its properties say we want to 
get its asset ID. The way we can do that now is we go, okay, I've got um, a node, this is another variable, and I want to get the hydrant. So we go from the network, I want to find a row object, object from a table at like the database, and I will explain this all in a moment, hydrant. And then this is the, um, the node ID. So the way this works is we're asking the network to run a function, and the function that, or a procedure, some code, that finds a one single, what InfoWorks calls a row object, which is basically, if you, you're familiar with the, the network, the, the Jada tree object is basically a single line, a single object in your um, network. We're gonna say we want um, a hydrant, which is located on the hydrants table with this ID. And if we want to output something, we'll say, okay, puts um, this node has an asset ID of, and we can collect information from the node. We say node dot, and then we want to access a property, asset ID. Um, and we know that's asset ID because we can see it here. And if we hover over it, you can see fields has come up, which shows that that is the, the name in the database behind the scenes is that's where the information is stored. So if we now save this um, and click run, we can see this node has an asset ID of 876654. There we go. You can see it's it's found this node, it's saved it to a variable, and we've accessed a bit of information from that variable. Um, Nathan, if you ever have any questions as I'm going through this, always feel free to ask as well if you think I need to clarify anything too. Um, now, we obviously can access information, but we can all set things as well. So say here we have a hydrant with a diameter of 80. If we want to set that to 90, you might be tempted to go, oh, well, all I have to do is go node, diameter is diameter field, Duh. can I just set it to 90 like that? Will that set um, this field? And we can give it a shot. If we run it now, we'll see it comes up with an error. It says objects may only be updated when a transaction is active. And what that's saying is you need to tell InfoWorks that you're making changes um, so that it, you, you basically designate when you're gonna make changes and when you save them. And then that's the, the same as if you're familiar with it, you have the undo and redo. Basically, when you create a transaction, everything you change can be undoed uh, within the thing. So to, to make that, we have to start a transaction to basically tell um, transaction begin, tell InfoWorks that we are making some changes. We're starting the transaction. And at the end, we have to say transaction commit to say we're finished. And then there is one other little step. You've also got to confirm that you've finished writing on each object. So when you set this value, this only lives in Ruby land. When you actually do dot write, you're writing, you're basically telling InfoWorks, okay, I've made my changes in my code, put that to the database, and then the database will then register that all as one transaction. So you can make multiple changes um, in a single transaction. Um, but anytime you make an object, a change in objects, you've got to also write it. Uh, and we can also, we can change multiple things. So if we want to change the flag, so this is the, the flag here, we want to change that to say SD. Uh, we can do multiple changes at once. So if we run the script now, we should see this is 80 and AO. If we run it, we'll see that's changed to 90 and SD now. So your basic um, update um, as you go along. So pretty nice. Um, but you know you don't want to be changing things one by one. So there is the opportunity to also um, come through and um, make changes uh, to multiple objects. So I'm just gonna get rid of, well, I'm gonna comment these out. So the, what this is, if you put a little hash in front, it makes a green and that's basically say to ignore all these codes because this is just a comment. So you say, uh, er, um, I'm writing some, oopsies, writing some code below. And anything with this hash in front is gonna be ignored by the, the script, it's just a comment. So we want to get all the, now if we want to access multiple objects at once, we can ask um, InfoWorks to provide us multiple objects. So once again, we're going to talk to the network object and say we want a row object collection. Uh, and then we're going to say the table we want. So before we had asked for a single object and now we're asking for a collection and we're going to say WN pipes. And what this is going to do, it's going to get every single pipe in this network and put it into a variable. And we can test that by looking at puts how many pipes, and we can then look at that object, all pipes, and go length, and it will tell us how many pipes are in this variable. And 
you know, or how many are in the network. So if we run the script now, no such table. Oops, that's a good one. It's if we look at the code here, it says no such table. It's because I've misspelled the type table here. It's actually WN pipe, not piped. So you, the list of all these for ICM, Info Asset, and InfoWorks will be in the um, in that big documentation as well. So if we now run this, you can see uh, it's gone and got every pipe and said there's 378. Um, now, if you want to work on, on these individually, we have to do a um, a loop. So we can work through them one by one. And the way that we do this is with a all the all pipes dot each so for each of the pipes we want to do something with them so we want for each pipe we do convention says ro for row object but it's probably easy to think of this as pipe so for all the pipes for each of them we're going to do what's inside this block of code here and we're going to access each with a new variable called pipe so if we go put um, pipe dot id it's going to loop through every single pipe on this um, on this model and then output its ID. So if we go here, you'll see it's like outputted every single ID for every single pipe. So scripts are fast, so don't worry, even if you have a really large model, like say for example, this guy, which has uh, thousands of pipes, it's still gonna run, oopsies, my mistake, it's uh, trying to get rid of this guy. Um, if we run it even on a large model like this, um, it will still output super fast, even if there's thousands and thousands of pipes on here. So let's go back to my other model. Let's say we want to do, you know, do something for this. So we can obviously do it on each, but we want to make it conditional. So only do something if it's, um, you know, the correct condition. So that what we call an if statement. So um, instead of doing it for every pipe, we can check. So say if we want to identify if there's large pipes or small pipes, we can do what we call an if statement. So we say if ro dot diameter is greater than 500, this is a metric as well, not a 500 inch pipe. Uh, we're going to uh, put this is a big pipe. Um, else we can then say put this is a small pipe. And then to finish this block, we say end. All right, and now it's gonna run through each of these. And it will tell me each pipe, if it's big or small. What did I do wrong hey, again? Yeah, I think change RO to pipe. Oh, right, of course, sorry. I'm used to the convention. That's why it's good to have a second <laughs> set of eyes. Yeah, so that case, I accidentally wrote RO instead of pipe. So if we click here, we'll see. It's listed every pipe and told me if it's a small, small pie small pipe <laughs> uh, instead of a, a big one. I guess we've got lots of small ones in here. Did it not? Small pipe dot diameter. Make sure diameter is greater than. Um, and then, wait, I'm just gonna copy this here because this was working before, just make sure. We can also change the code here if we want multiple statements as well. So say greater than 500, greater than 250. So if this is a big pipe, this isn't too big, this is small. And we can also do selections as well. So in this case, it's gonna select everything greater than 250, but less than 500. So if we run it. I should just add a comment that your your model is uh, probably in you know in millimeters. Um, oh, so right, yeah. the script, script in the interface is gonna interpret whatever local user use, units you're using, so. Yeah, if, if you set yourself up in um, metric uh, or um, American standard, then that would work. So now we can see it's um, anything above 250 millimeters, I don't know what that is in inches, has been selected and everything else hasn't. Um, yeah, so then that's like doing conditional statements. Uh, and then last, we can also you know do these statements where we um, update as well. So if we have a look at this guy, uh, if you live outside America, sometimes you have to deal with things in both metric and um, and in Imperial, so which just makes life very difficult. Um, so for example, here we, in a GIS, we have um, a mixture of um, GIS data, both in millimeters and inches. So it's very common for people in Australia, the UK to have to deal with both units, but we'll convert them. So we could write a little script here that looks at the user text field one and user text two, uh, text one, and then set the diameter. So once again, we can, Copy a little bit of code into here. I'm just going to copy into just keep us on time. 
Um, you want to do it? I can just grab this bit here. So what it's going to do, we're still going to go through each pipe, um, each pipe, and then we're going to look at if the user text one says inches, we're going to then set the diameter. Um, and we're going to times user text one to change it from inches to millimeters. But if it's um, already in, in millimeters, we can just use it as it is. And it's going to then write the changes. Um, and then you also have to remember to have the transactions for this to work as well. So if we do this, um, transactions begin. And then we run this last script here. Um, and it should, if we, everything's right, it should set the diameters correctly for us. So let me just give myself some space here. And then we run this script. There we go. Oh, there's no asset IDs on these, but it has gone through and updated each of the diameters automatically. So you can see now anything that was inches has been converted to millimeters. Anything that was millimeters is, is stayed millimeters. So simple tasks like that where you're working through can be automated. So typically you might have imported them manually and then gone and updated um, as you need. But with Ruby scripts, you can um, totally automate those processes. Uh, and avoid the manual things. Or you might accidentally forget to convert one and all something instead of having a, a large pipe, you have like a you know, six millimeter pipe, which is like, I don't know, a quarter of an inch instead of being something that's a, you know six inches. Um, yeah, so this is uh, just a, a very quick intro into using Ruby um, and how you can sort of run and write code. So I know if you're totally new, this might have been a little bit of a shock. Um, but just giving you some examples of interacting and creating information. So we can jump back into the presentation and because that worked, I can skip that. Um, I think we saw in one of the examples where an error came up, um, but you'll probably run into this a lot as you are using Ruby scripts. Now the first, what you need to know is the first couple of lines are gonna tell you what the error is. So in this one, it's the transactions weren't active. So you had to turn on transactions for it to work. Or in this one, we're saying the variable doesn't exist, we probably made a typo. So you want to read these first couple of lines to understand what you did wrong. And then the last line tells you where that code went wrong. So you can see it says, okay, in example.rb, line after this colon is 16. That's saying line 16 of our code, there was, a, there was an issue. And same with this one, um, you want to look at the very last one and say 32. That's where you want to find um, any issues um, with your code is that, you know, you know, you'll, you'll get used to them. You'll see the same errors over and over again. First thing you should do is just go straight to this line and see if you've made something um, obvious, an obvious mistake. Um, do we have any questions before we jump into some of the open source yeah. examples, Nathan? Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was an excellent walkthrough. There, there have been yeah. a handful of questions that have come in. One, I was going to try to maybe stop you, but there was a couple of questions about the WN in uh, in the syntax that, that you, yeah. you called. So like WN underscore hydrant. And yeah. that is really, yeah, I'll, I'll let you answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's just, uh, you can almost say convention. So if you look at, um, I wonder if I can find the, uh, the list here. So WN Hydrant, it's like the, the table that's behind the scenes in InfoWorks that, so there's a database behind the scenes. And this is the table of like the, where the information is stored. So you find a list of everything in, um, this the exchange document that's provided. So, you know, customer points have a certain name, hydrants have a certain name, um, and WN, I think, is water network. And if you use um, ICM, it's WAMS, which I don't know what that stands for, Nathan. Actually, oh, no, actually, ICM is, is HW. Oh, I think this might be a... Sorry, I might I think those are word. asset management. Yeah. CAMS might be asset. Oh, HW? Yeah, HW, yep. That's HW, yeah. So you'll have the same thing with um, ICM. You'll have something... Uh, uh, HW and then the, the name of the the table. So in the uh, in this document, it does actually go through all that information, explaining where you can find them, and it, yeah, it does uh, explain uh, that that little first bit. So yeah, HW for uh, uh, ICM and WN for uh, WS Pro. And he, uh, just just my quick comment on this guide, um, definitely not something you want to try to read through, but what I like to do is just take example scripts, like what he just showed you, um, take examples if you're new to Ruby, edit it, and then whenever you have a question about like what is WN underscore hydrant, then just do the, the control F and search. And yeah. you know, this is guide, don't read it, just, just reference it. With, it's definitely a reference with, guide. So just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other questions there that maybe 
Um, yeah, how about, um, can you graph simulation results using the same, uh, using a, a, a script? Yeah, definitely. Um, so not in WS Pro, uh, which is probably gonna be great news for everyone else besides me, but in ICM, there is um, functionality, which I, I haven't done to create graphs. So there is this function here uh, called graph. Um, and I think, Nathan, you showed an example of a Ruby yeah. script um, where you can custom generate uh, graphs, um, you know, so you can see here that it does define it all. And maybe that'd be a good example to, to include in the library I'm gonna show you shortly. But yeah, you can create custom graphs though. I've never done it before. Um, oh, here, here's a good one. Can you call uh, an InfoWorks SQL script from Ruby? You betcha. And then I yeah. did write this actually down. So um, if you are um, more used to using SQL and you want to take the, you have a hammer and everything is a nail approach, um, say you have this store query here and this store query is basically going to select every node that has an X greater than this value. If I drop this in here, you'll see it will uh, select half the, the, the network. If you want to run this, there it is possible to do this in, um, in Ruby, all you do is once again, all we need is the network. There is a command called uh, net.run and it's called SQL. And then you once you have to say that the table name, so that WN underscore thing, and, and then you just put in here whatever you 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 wrote like this. So if we want to run this SQL um, from Ruby script, you can now run it, and it will select half the, 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 the selection there. So yeah, if you're used to running Ruby's uh, SQLs to update or change, you can just drop in a bunch of these one after the other, and then um, yeah, use that uh, as an easy way to get into Ruby scripting. And there is an option as well to, you know, when we show the collection of all pipes, you can say, actually, I just wanted everything that was selected. So if you're more comfortable running a, a SQL um, query like that, and then, then you can run, uh, I think it's like, um, row object selection or something like that, where it will um, death provide everything that you've selected. So that's a, a good avenue to, to work on as well. Yeah, that's a, a good good comment. Um, there's another question that's relevant. Um, would you prefer Ruby over SQL for tasks like this? And um, I'll just comment that I, I, I've become much more comfortable in, in SQL. So like when I when I do Ruby scripting, I basically do what, what Luke just said, where you know, I, I let my script script do what the script needs to do, but I, I lean on SQL whenever possible. Um, but yeah, it's it's really just depending on on your preference and your comfort level. Yeah, if if I think um, you you've got to use what you're comfortable with, um, and that will be where you're most productive. And I think it really changes when you want to do conditional things, like if it's this, do that, and you're really diving into some more uh, detailed stuff. That's probably where it's easier to use um, Ruby than. Than script. So there's no reason you can't combine the two to, to work together for, for, you know, for whatever works best for you. Um, but yeah, so like once you get into larger examples, it's it's definitely makes more sense to go Ruby. But the other thing is as well, if you want to provide um, SQL scripts, sometimes you got to tell people to collect the right ones and run them in the right order. You could just embed them all in a Ruby script and it will run automatically. So that's another option for you too. Yeah, th there's there's a quite a good number of questions. I I admit I'm not able to keep up with these. So um, yeah, well why don't why don't you move on, Luke? I'm yeah, gonna yeah. try to like read these and prioritize them, and, and we'll come back to questions at the end. Of course. Um, so I mentioned earlier in the um, in the presentation that I created some open source examples for people. Um, so if you go to um, and we'll provide this link. It's on GitHub. Um, it's a uh, it's a uh, for people who aren't familiar with GitHub. GitHub is a a um, it's like a website where you can share code and people can work on code together. So it's almost like a like a semi social network for writing and distributing and, and making code. Um, so I share a bunch of code that I write on this platform, and in one of the ones is uh, Infoworks Ruby scripts, um, and I have a whole range of scripts here you can read about, starting from the most simple, so like modifying data. Uh, up to a complete model build and run example. So the full spectrum, so no matter where you are, you can you know, start with the most simple task uh, to, to very, very complex tasks. And it provides you that, some like real life examples of writing Ruby scripts. So none of these like, hello world, change one little bit. It's like, these are a big examples. So basically you can click on anything. So like this modified network data example, uh, it was very similar to what we saw before. Uh, you'll see here, it provides some information about it. 
uh, and you can actually click on to the Ruby scripts within here uh, and it will give lots of comments. So anything with this hash in front is a comment, explains the code. Um, I walk through the steps here uh, and then each time we write code, I try to explain why we're doing things. And it, it gives you the ability to download, make small modifications and um, play with uh, the code that actually works instead of you know starting with a blank slate and being unfamiliar exactly what you're working on. So like say this is a, a very simple example to change from inches to millimeters. Um, it can get more complex um, as you go up. So for example, um, the open data import center. So uh, for, I'm sure, I, I'm sure ICM has the exact same thing where you can go um, uh, update open data import center. You've got, uh, you know, bring in information. You can automate this whole flow. So I've got an example here where it shows you, um, you know, here's all the different bits of uh, parameters and codes that, that match up with the, uh, the user interface and what you have to write. Um, and then the full script here that steps you through, you know, this will import multiple files, check that the files are there and, and snap everything together. Uh, and then this is the one that was connected to that um, LinkedIn article uh, that I talked about before. So if you want more information on it, you can go in here um, and you can read the, it will actually step you through um, that process similar to what we saw before, but doing the imports. And then finally, the, the, the most complex example, which I think I will touch on in a bit more detail later, is a full model build and run. So this will, uh, in this example, it's a, an exchange version, but it includes all the source data, so all the GIS data you need as well. So you can download this and it will create the, the, the master database. It will import all the files. It will expand the links. It will set data um, like materials, roughnesses. Um, it will allocate customers. It will set up controls on closed pipes, PRVs, fixed heads, and then run the model or validate the model and run it. So this is basically, if you want a starter pack for creating a digital twin, this is where you want to go because this will have basically, you know, raw GIS to a running model. You can, you know, open up this example and go straight through. Um, you could basically copy and impress your boss very quickly that you are automating your build um, overnight. So this will step you every single aspect of expanding links, elevations, setting up controls, um, doing demand analysis, um, running simulations, validating the network. Um, yeah, so this is a, a big one as well, which I think will have a um, yeah big impact, especially if you're an experienced program and you want to get into the, the detail of it, um, you can um, definitely learn a lot here. Uh, yeah, so I'm sure we'll provide that link afterwards so that you can get access to, to all of these as well. Um, and then this is the full list. Um, the thing, great thing about uh, GitHub is it's a, a social site. So if people ever ask me questions about, oh, I, I want to know how to do this in Ruby, generally instead of me just solving it for them, um, I'll I'll write the example and then I'll just share it here as well because you know no point just one person having it. Uh, it's a good place to have um, you know anyone can work on it. So if you do have any like Ruby questions that or like things that you think are good examples, uh, chances are I'll throw them up here. And I would love to eventually have more um, ICM examples here too. Um, obviously, I just don't have um, ICM license or, or knowledge, but eventually that would be good. And I think there has been some discussions, Nathan, about potentially getting something similar set up um, on the Innovia side, right? Yeah, yeah. The there, there, there are a number of people internal that that are that are uh, <laughs> pushing, pushing to get our own Innovise uh, shared repository. Um, I'm hoping to see that someday soon, but be yeah. tight for now. <laughs> um, any more questions from that? Did you gather through before we go into some more detailed big examples? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Let's see, do, do you need Inforx Exchange to run the full model build script? Uh, yes, yes. Th that, that version that I've got, you, it is based around um, Exchange, so you will, will need that. Um, and I'm going to demo soon a version. Before I got to that, I actually did the whole build with, with just within the UI, so I will show that it is possible. Um, but some aspects like the demand allocation and the running of the network or the creating of, of, of model objects is um, it's limited to exchange, but there are big components of that that you can pick up and move to just UI. And maybe that's a good example. I could create one that's just the user interface version that would work just as well. So as the current stands, yes, you need the license, but it doesn't mean that you can't get 90% of the way there. Okay, good. Um, do, do you have an example for updating pump curves from an external database uh, using Ruby? 
Um, I haven't done that before, uh, but it should be possible that everything is in the database. Um, what That gets a little trickier because it's a thing called structured data. So it's no longer just rows, it's like rows within rows. Um, so there is an example here um, I've got, it's called modifying structured data. And I believe this one updates the, um, the depth um, curve for a, a tank. So if, for example, you had a, I don't know if I have it, if we had a, a tank in here, let me just really create the world's fastest uh, reservoir. Um, in it, you'd have, um, where is it, depth volume? So you have like one and then it's like 1,000, two and then say 3,000. Uh, I know this is a different example, but it's the same thing where you have a row with multiple fields in it. The same idea with a pump curve where you would have to open up this curve and then modify internally. There is an example here showing you how to do that with a, a tank depth curve. You could apply the same logic to a pump curve. I haven't tried it. Uh, it's definitely one I can take away and try to, to adapt. Um, but you can also connect to external resources through APIs or web calls. So if you save that in a database, you, in theory, you could extract it, then update it as well. So yes, I haven't tried it, um, but it, it is possible. Sorry, I was trying to uh, unmute. Um, uh, someone okay. asked, can can you share your LinkedIn uh, and GitHub links? Yeah, I, I suppose I could have asked that, but yeah, if we throw it, throw it in, if I throw it in the chat, will everyone see it? Yeah, yeah, you should be able yeah. to put it. I'm going to chat. put in the the link there, um, so you can get access to that. I don't know if we're going to be providing these PowerPoints later on, or I don't know how it normally works, but. Um, but I mean, it, if you have a look there, you should see it. And then if you want my LinkedIn, I have a thing so I don't get distracted, which I still do all the time anyway. Let's see. I think I should be able to click on here and I'm gonna drop this in as well. So if you wanna connect with me, um, you can too. So I have uh, dropped that in the chat. You should be able to see it and we'll see if this network thing goes crazy or not with people trying to add me. Um, okay, yep, so anything else before we jump to some more I mean, I think the next stage is going to be real-world examples uh, of using Ruby. Yeah, let's let's jump into some of those. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the applications where I've used Ruby, and I will warn and apologize that some of this is shameless plugs because I do like talking about what I'm doing, I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I do find it interesting. So uh, I think we had asked a question about using the UI for model builds. So my initial model build was all in the UI because I didn't own an exchange license. So this video will quickly show you doing a full build within um, the UI. So it's importing the data, you know, getting polygons, creating short links, um, expanding the links, setting up controls. Um, so you just run a script and did the full build without having to have exchange. Uh, and if you look behind the scenes, there's a little bit more that's happening. Um, the next page, uh, if you have a look, we'll see that um, you know, it's it's um, renamed the nodes to be by convention. PA diameters have had a look up to, you know, set to the correct internal diameter and flag, roughness is set, did, uh, elevation is set, control set. So the, even though it was limited without the exchange, there was a whole set of um, builds that I was originally able to do with uh, Ruby without exchange. So yeah, definitely a lot of power there that you can get yourself going. So even some like small models like that took seconds, really large models, maybe five minutes. Um, and then eventually I um, updated this script to be that version that you saw um, with Exchange, just to give it a few extra bits and pieces. So like the demand analysis, the validating, the running. Um, and I created, you could say, almost like a commercial version that I provided to water utilities uh, that was much more suited for their individual purposes. But I created a, a generic version that anyone could use and adapt. So this is the um, generic version that we're seeing that's running the command line automatically. Um, but I did provide this as a custom solution to some utilities in the UK. Um, at least there was two UK utilities that used this um, to automate their model builds. So what they could do is they could put that script on a server and run that, that script every single night and it would automatically rebuild their entire model library set. So if they made any changes to GIS, like close valves, add new pipes, they would always have the latest set of models on their server whenever they wanted. So for the first UK utility, they had about 35 models that would automatically build. Uh, and the second UK utility had about 250 models that they would build. They were a very large utility with lots and lots of models. Um, they could um, 
basically run it, run it one after the other and they would be, be built in about five hours you know but if you look at the the size of them they are <laughs> not small small but yeah so this way that you know as they want to make updates they could just open up a version of infoworks and take the, the values as they need so this was uh if you're going towards that like digital twin path like this is the, the sort of the things that i was setting up for, for doing that um one other quick example this is i didn't do in ruby but i really really wish i had ruby um so about seven years ago i was a graduate um, i was we provided fire and flow information to external parties so i say a developer came and said oh, i want to know what the capacity of the, the network is here so i if i have to put sprinklers in we would open the model run the model Tell them, okay, five liters second to 30 liters second, what the residual pressure is, and they would then build a fire service. And then I was asked as a graduate, like, let's make this more efficient. What's the best way you can do that? And I said, well, we don't change this model like more than like once or twice a year. What happens if we just ran simulations at every single point in the network, stored in a database, and we'd never have to open the model again? Um, and at that point, there was no way you could do that in Ruby. Uh, so instead, we, we actually ended up breaking the network at 50 meter intervals, running fire flow analysis. You know, merging it all together in Excel, dropping it into a database, and actually end up with a, an application where we could click on any point in the network and get an instant letter that said the uh, fire flow and, uh, capacity um, throughout the network. So we could, instead of waiting five days to provide a letter, we could just instantly provide it to anyone. Um, this took, I think, a month of raw processing power because the models got huge. It was very cumbersome. But if you had Ruby, it would have been done uh, straight away. So definitely a task where you're trying to automate the analysis and extraction of information would have been a, a really nice task. So I'd love to, to set this up and do it again in the future. Um, and finally, because I obviously love building models, I, uh, I built a web-based tool to build models so I could do it outside of Exchange or automate it to, for more users and also get it for InfoWater. So this one is like a, a web application away from InfoWorks, but the way it sort of it, it does work is that you take GIS information in, you define how you want to filter information, um, you know, what fields are what in the model, uh, and they'll actually go through and build everything um, on a server. Uh, and then it like, then has an, an interface that you can then connect in with Exchange. So it's like a separate little tool that I created to, to automate and build models faster, but you could then you know, connect into your Exchange server and pull that information in. But this, this was so you could do not just InfoWorks, but you know, InfoWater, EPA, EPA Net, that type of thing as well. And finally, the other tool that I developed was one to get information out. So to help me calibrate models, um, you know, when you're constantly running models and changing values, it can be a little slow. So if you're familiar with water models, you can break them down into smaller and smaller components. Um, so what I did is I developed a web application where you could um, export a, a small subsection of a model, um, like say a DMA or a little metered area. Um, and Ruby would then collect all the information about that pi or that, that, that section, save it in a little file that you could then drop into my calibration application. Um, so here we'll show good, nice and fast. So you would select the area that you're interested in. You'd run a, a Ruby script, and this Ruby script would create a little file. It's got a little JSON file that has all your information in. You could then take that JSON file, drop it into my little web application that I, I wrote. Um, it would then run the model in a small little browser window, so it's a very tiny model. Uh, and then you can make calibration changes. So say if you wanted to throttle valves, like I'm doing here, or change C factors, or whoopsies, I, we set it. Um, so if you wanted to change C factors or throttle valves or PRV settings, you could. So it's going to quickly go through this, but it'll show you it's changing um, the throttle settings on valves. And as it's doing, it's rerunning the model. And um, because you're working with a really small section, you could very quickly find the right calibration setting uh, for your model. Then you take it back to InfoWorks, uh, rerun the model, everything's good. Then you just move to the next one. So this was another really helpful bit to be able to take information out and then bring it back into InfoWorks. Um, but yeah, this is a, a bespoke tool that I created to help me you know, get those, uh, go from uncalibrated, which is the blue line, the, and the, the green is the, uh, the results we record in the field. And then as we change, you can see they start to match nicely uh, with calibration. But yeah, the, the part of Ruby here was the transfer in and out of data. So that uh, is the end of my shameless plug of all the cool things I've developed. Um, is there any other questions or anything else that's come through, Nathan? I think we like hit. Um, yeah, yeah. So one, I have plenty of time to ask questions or anything that comes through. Yeah, yeah, that was excellent. I think we might run uh, over a, a minute or two, um, just just due to the, the the good number of questions, and and you know, obviously, you guys can feel free. Feel free to go. Um, I did mention uh, that we will be sending the recording to all of the attendees. I think that's not a problem. 
Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, there, there was a quick question. Uh, what are these external apps made in? So your your tool, I think you probably made some people jealous with that last, <laughs> that last one. I know I was yeah. <laughs> jealous. Yeah, so these um, are, uh, they're web-based tools. So I write them in JavaScript slash TypeScript. Um, so that's another programming language that I'm very familiar with. And if you're a programmer, it's it uses React. So um, I don't want to hijack this too much, but they are they do exist um, as like websites where you can like uh, yeah, it just a, a website itself. So like the idea is that if then if you like select valves, um, this is like a little EPA net model running in the background. So as you make changes, the blue is the simulated results and the the green is the um, what we record in the field. So you can see all these like green dots are hydrants that we logged, and you can you know play with it and see what how the model reacts in almost real time. Um, yeah, so but that's uh, you know, I save one here like little JSON files that you would that contain all the information about the model that, and it would like load up a, a model for you and run it. So yeah, JavaScript basically. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, I did see a question. Um... Are there plans to make similar API uh, ability for info water, info sewer, info swim product lines? Um, fingers crossed for Python. Uh, I, I think I saw a couple people. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know of current plans at the moment. I know that because uh, those tools, the, a lot of the data is inside of you know GIS format, like uh, D, um, DBF tables and so on, that, that you can do. A number of things with Python, but um, yeah, and unfortunately, the the model data itself is not super friendly to to open open scripting, and and uh, for whatever reason, I think some of the the info water info swim community hasn't had the same appetite for this kind of uh, getting into the weeds as as the info works community. Um, but but yeah, I'll, 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 um, I, I, yeah, I can't I can't speak to it, but I don't know of any plans at the moment. There might be a user voice. Um, area where there's a vote for that. Yeah, there is some there is some ability, um, and I, I now I have to use InfoWater quite a bit. Um, I don't know if you know, but if you look at the actual out file, there is a um, in certain scenarios you'll see something called um, this out file, which contains all the information about the results. I'm currently in the works of running a Python script to open up and read this information, just because I want to be able to quickly interrogate that against live information. So if you keep an eye on my LinkedIn, I am trying to write something for Python to make it easier for you to access live, uh, well, results out of the model as well. So it's uh, something that I would love as well, and I'm trying to, to solve in my own little way too. So hopefully one day, if not, everyone should just change to InfoWorks because it's so much better, but that's just my personal opinion. Amazing to be complaining um, about this many times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so Luke is definitely someone you don't you do want to connect with on on LinkedIn yeah. um, to get free stuff like that. Um, great. Uh, yeah, we we are running out of time unfortunately, but um, I will uh, circle back with our team to see if we can try to get some some answers to some of these unanswered questions. Um, uh, thank you guys for all the questions you did submit. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, I do see requests on, can we get another webinar on Ruby and SQL, please? Um, yes, uh, I, yeah, we, we, can definitely, we can definitely prioritize that. Uh, um, but with that, uh, yeah, I think we should be, should be wrapping up. So um, recording will be coming. Um, you have our contacts. Uh, and yeah, have a, great, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Luke, um, for all the work you put in to, to share what you've done. Uh, with the team, with uh, with our users. Yeah, I hope everyone found it uh, useful and was able to learn something. Awesome. All right. Have a good day, everyone.